Welcome to this uh, PCR webinar uh, on the importance of valve hemodynamics and valve durability in the lifetime management of patients with severe aortic stenosis. My name is Lars Sandergaard. I'm a cardiologist based in Copenhagen, Denmark. And it's my pleasure to be joined by Francesco Maisano, who is a cardiac surgeon, but also doing catheter-based interventions in Milan, Italy, and Nicola Piazza, who is a cardiac uh, interventionist uh, based in Montreal, Canada. So uh, the topic we're going to, to touch on today here, uh, if you can see, is the learning objectives here, is to understand um, uh, how patient with this mismatch may impact both the, uh, the clinical outcome for the patient, but also certainly the valve durability, and also to learn how to identify patients who are at specific risk for patient prestige mismatch after aortic valve replacement. And finally, to understand how different design of these fibrostatic aortic valve will influence the hemodynamic outcomes. So I think in order to kick this discussion off, um, I'm just going to show the case we're going to review a bit later today here, and uh, we can start uh, looking at this. So this is a relatively young lady, 72 years of age, so she got uh, limited medical history, ITL hypertension, also some spinal stenosis. So she got probably quite long life expectancy. So of course, um, valve durability is going to be important for her if she get a vibrostatic aortic valve. She's a small lady, only 156 centimeter, and weight is 51 kilogram. And she was actually referred to us uh, due to increasing his symptoms. She was in function class 2B and under, came under the diagnosis, uh, severe aortic stenosis. And the workup confirmed that. We did an echocardiography and could see that there was a severe aortic stenosis. Actually, the valve area is not here, but it was 0.5 square centimeter, high gradient, peak gradient of 94 millimeter mercury and mean gradient 61 millimeter mercury, preserved systolic function of the deaf ventricular ventricle. Coronary angiography showed no significant stenosis. She was in sinus rhythm without any conduction abnormality. And also her lapse finding was normal. There was no anemia, renal function was normal. So as you can see here, the calculated STS score for mortality was low, only 1.4%. As always uh, for this patient, before we had uh, the heart team discussion on how to treat it, we did a CT scan to have all the anatomical information on it. And it showed that the patient had a relative small aortic annulus uh, perimeter derived diameter was 22 millimeter. And the different trigger alpha tract had the same diameter. So there was no difference between the aortic annulus and the LVOT diameter. Uh, we could also see that its uh, sinus of a cell was quite white. There was no issues here about coronary obstruction and ST junction was also within a proper range. Um, the valve was moderate to see severe calcified, as you can see here, it was a tricuspid uh, aortic valve with quite a lot of calcification of all three leaflets, but not extending down to the left ventricular alpha tract. So it was only on the leaflet themselves. Coronary heights, um, if we can move forward, is was good, right, uh, 17 millimeter high and the left main was 60 millimeter high. So that again, in combination with white sinus of the salva, we did not foresee any issues here with the coronary arteries uh, during a potential thyroid procedure. And we also looked at uh, where to position your C-arm for implantation use. So if you want to use a uh, right left cosmo lab view, which most sites will do nowadays in order to minimize the risk of conduction abnormality, it was feasible, only RAO 4 degrees and call 28 degrees. A classical three cost co planar view was in LAO 14, a quarter 11 degrees. Aortic arch without any severe calcification, smooth arch without any acute angulation, and you can see the three neck vessels was taken up normally, so, so she would potentially be a candidate for cerebral embolic protection. And then finally, of course, it was important to see that she was suitable for a transfemoral approach in case of TAVI. And you can see here, uh, not a very tortuous excess vessel, not a lot of calcium and good 
caliber on the right side, the minimum diameter was uh, 8.2 uh, millimeter. So maybe we can uh, discuss this case here. Um, and um, Francesco, you as a surgeon know that um, some of these patients are prone to have uh, early valve failure. And uh, of course, that's particularly important if you treat patients with longer life expectancy to ensure that the patient will have a biprostatic valve which is going to, to last long. So what patient characteristics and also particularly for the aortic valve is going to determine uh, the durability of these valve or is going to be put the patient at risk for early valve failure? Uh, you know, one of the, so this, this patient is actually a patient uh, uh, with uh, a age which is borderline in, in the decision-making algorithm between uh, surgery and TAVI. Uh, according to the European guidelines, this age is 74. So we, have, we are two years earlier than the official, uh, let's say, rule which is obviously something that we need to learn is not going to be a rule for every patient. We have to, be, uh, we, we have to adapt uh, a number of different factors in the decision-making, including patient characteristics and patient uh, uh, willingness to get one or, or the other procedure. Obviously, when we go into this specific uh, age population without important comorbidities, we need to be very careful on selecting the right, uh, the right procedure. And we know in surgery that smaller ladies have a high risk of getting patient prosthesis mismatch, which is uh, uh, the main determinant today of uh, early prosthetic uh, valve failure. So uh, we start from here, which I think is the most important point, but obviously, this lady also has some renal dysfunction, if I understand. And so all this can uh, lead to some uh, uh, reduced durability. Uh, it's very important to realize that if you look at the, uh, at the uh, overall uh, surgical uh, experience, uh, the female gender, uh, the female sex, sorry, is associated with higher mortality. Uh, both in the short and long term, and most of this is associated to the risk of ag having a patient prosthesis mismatch after the procedure. Uh, don't forget, patient prosthesis mismatch happens about uh, one third of patients undergoing surgery today. And me personally, as a surgeon, believe I believe that this is a malpractice. So we need to avoid it. So, so what is a small surgical valve, uh, Francesco? What, what's, what size? I mean, you use different labels for surgical valve and transcatheter heart valve. So, so when are you considering a, a surgical biprostatic valve to be too small? Is there any specific cutoff number? Well, again, this is a, you, you may answer with a very simplistic answer, uh, 19, 21, whatever. Obviously, you need to uh, you need to consider the size of the patient. This is a very small lady, so probably in a patient like this, you you will you need to be able to implant a valve which is uh, beyond 19. I usually never implant a 19 valve. It's very rare. Uh, but again, this is something that uh, you need to look at the uh, at, at the uh, charts and be sure that you are implanting a device which is not inducing patient prosthesis mismatch. If this is the case, then you need to really consider alternatives, which are on one side, you can use a specific valve. We can discuss later on, on what has been the evolution of different valves. You can think about if you want to remain within the surgical domain, you may think about a sutureless or a, 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 a valve which is stentless eventually. Uh, uh, you may think about uh, uh, expanding the annulus. You may think about even uh, replacing with uh, 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 pericardium with the Ozaki technique. A lot of, lot of things can be done, but consider that everything I'm talking about is increasing the risk of the procedure. So uh, today, in, in the era of lifetime management and in the era of the modern uh, structural interventions, 
we need to keep the eyes open and be able and and and, and be ready eventually to uh, embark in a different uh, direction even if the patient is below 74 uh, this could be a good candidate for Tavi. Hmm. So, so Nico, um, we were talking about uh, patient prostate smear. So, so just in line now, so what, what do we mean about patient prostate smear? How can we identify whether a patient will have a too small valve? Uh, yeah, Lars, so, you know, patient prosthesis mismatch uh, basically means that the patient has a normal functioning prosthesis, uh, but the prosthesis is too small for the patient's body size. Um, and so uh, PPM, as they call it, uh, not for permanent pacemaker, uh, but for patient prosthesis mismatch, um, uh, really is the effective orifice area that you calculate after your procedure uh, divided by the body surface area. And so, um, you know, we calculated this patient's body surface area uh, before the webinar, um, and it was 1.5 meters squared. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about what are the definitions of PPM, um, if the body mass index, the BMI, is less than 30, uh, then PPM begins at 0.85. Uh, mm -hmm. 0.65 to 0.85 is moderate, and below 0.65 is severe. And so you can work yourself backwards. You have a ratio then where PPM is equal to EOA over body surface area. Uh, we have the um, minimal uh, PPM we're going to accept, which is 0.85. So 0.85 equals uh, your expected EOA over the body surface area, which is 1.5. So this patient needs a valve area of at least 1.27 after the procedure uh, so that they do, they do not develop moderate or severe PPM. Um, so we'll talk later on about the valve size selection uh, based on the measurements. Uh, but, you know, on the surgical side, Francesco was talking about, you know, what it means to have a small uh, prosthesis. He said 19 or 21, and of course it depends on the, the body surface area of the patient. On the transcatheter side, um, I think we've used uh, either an area of 430 millimeters squared or which equates to about an annulus diameter of about 23. And, and that's what they're using in the SMART trial, uh, which is comparing balloon expandable to self-expanding valves in small annuli. So 430 as an area or 23 millimeters as a diameter. Hmm. So, Francesca, let's say this patient was going for surgery. We already uh, touched on that. What kind of different surgical valve do you have, and, and how is it designed uh, in order to to, to minimize uh, the risk? So, of PPM? I, uh, as you know, uh, surgical aortic valve replacement is uh, uh, happening since many, many years. Probably we're talking about more than 60 years now. And there has been a continuous evolution on technology. The original valves were almost all of them porcine. Uh, now most of the valves are uh, bovine pericardium. The advantage of bovine pericardium is to enhance uh, the valve area, uh, the effective orifice area of this uh, 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 prosthesis, mainly because uh, the porcine uh, annulus is very muscular and when you implant the valve inside, inside of the stent, in, when you implant the porcine valve in inside of the stent, you, you will pay uh, this, uh, uh, this space in terms of uh, effective opening. There have been also a trend to develop uh, supraannular valves and supraannular in, uh, in surgery doesn't mean that you are going to be at the level of the coronaries Supraannular means that once you remove the native valve leaflets, then you can implant the valve inside the annulus or above the annulus. And in this way, usually you gain one or two sizes. Uh, there have been also, there are some designs where the leaflets, the bovine leaflets are attached on the outer frame of the, of the posts of the, of the, uh, of the stent. Uh, where uh, the, the, the valve is implanted. These devices have been uh, de designed really to uh, cope with patient prosthesis mismatch, particularly for small, for, for small annuli. Uh, 
uh, these vats, as we know, once they they generate, they become a little bit challenging to be managed by uh, valve in valve. Uh, there have been also uh, a number of uh, concepts on uh, on uh, uh, stentless valves, uh, either using uh, kind of a root replacement approach, or in, in some cases uh, just lifted implanted directly on the on the on the annuals, you can imagine how more difficult and, more, and less reproducible becomes the procedure once uh, you don't have a structured uh, stent uh, frame. And uh, finally, uh, there, have, there are two devices available in the market for uh, uh, sutureless valves. These are basically uh, uh, similar to THV valves, to, to, to TAVI valves. Uh, balloon or self-expanding. In this case, uh, you gain uh, 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 you gain uh, valve orifice opening by using some degree of oversizing, uh, which is what usually we do in uh, in transcader valves. So again, mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there is a number of different devices. Mm -hmm. There have been a, a, a tremendous evolution in the history of uh, uh, of prosthesis. If you uh, if you look at the history, I, I don't even know how many, but we, are, we have hundreds of different uh, designs which have been developed to improve uh, uh, hemodynamics, but also durability, uh, different ways to manage the tissue uh, in, uh, with different technologies, and still going on. And particularly, for instance, there is one valve which has been recently developed specifically for valve in valve in the future, which allows once and if the valve degenerates to implant a larger t uh, uh, THV valve in a valve in a valve procedure uh, in, in, in order to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch in the concept of lifetime management. So we see already a lot of uh, uh, interactions and, and cross fertilization between the two uh, areas uh, and we'll see what happens in the future. Mm. Francesco, you had a comment? Yeah, Francesco, I wanted to ask, um, you know, we have the uh, privilege with TAVI to get a CT scan before, um, you know, we can predict what type of valve uh, we're going to choose. Uh, and of course, we can, you know, like we did just previously, we can, ex you know, use the charts uh, that are available to us to see whether or not the patient will develop patient prosthesis mismatch. When the surgeon goes into surgery, um, you know, they use a dilator, correct? They use a dilator or they use some sizing tool uh, in order to select the valve, but then you're stuck during the procedure. You have, you have to make a decision um, and you might end up having uh, to put in a smaller valve than you would like. Do you think surgeons should start looking at CT scans uh, before? and size uh, surgical valves based on the CT scan, or that's not possible? Yeah, so Nico, it is possible somebody is also doing that. I think it's obviously uh, in my practice, uh, a, a CT scan is performed in 100% of patients undergoing an intervention, either surgery or percutaneous, because you get so much information besides the annual size. And to be honest, I don't use uh, the uh, sizing of the annuals in, in, uh, by, by CT scan because actually it's very, very easy once you decalcify to identify exactly the size of the annuals at that time. And the reason for uh, undersizing in some patients is not because of the missizing, it's mainly because of uh, surgical technique and to some extent to the fear of the surgeon to not be able to fit the valve inside of the uh, remaining annulus. And sometimes also because you, the fear of uh, decalcifying the annulus completely. So there are many reasons why in some cases you get patient prosthesis mismatch. I have been uh, raised in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a center where We've been very uh, careful to obtain always the best uh, uh, hemodynamics. But still, I remember when I was younger, uh, you know, I was taught how to implant the valve. You should use the sizer 
if you can size it 21, then you implant in 19. That was the, the rule many years ago. Uh, in my practice, uh, I, when I size a 19, I try to push a 21. <laughs> and this is also sometimes not uh, free from, uh, from uh, uh, complications. You need to be ready. And not every patient uh, can accept this kind of uh, approach. But, you know, uh, in some cases, you may uh, get stuck in the alpha track because of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of some uh, uh, hypertrophy of the septum. And so you're not measuring the real annuals. You're measuring the, uh, the alpha track. Uh, you may undersize because of that, or maybe you are, uh, it's an irredu patient and you have a stented uh, a mitral prosthesis and you get wrong measurements. So that means that to some extent, having support of a CT scan measurement prior to the procedure may become an additional uh, tool also for surgery and should become for all mm -hmm. surgery in the future. So also we know that um, also for the transcatheter heart valve, that will be different on the hemodynamic performance. So if you can just get this slide back uh, uh, on here. Um, so we can see here. So, so we don't have a lot of data to try to compare the hemodynamics between valves. We have some from the Portico ID trial, which was run in the U.S. comparing Portico with any commercial valve available valve, which at that time was the Evolu platform and the Sapien 3 platform. You can see here, if you take those patients, 870 patients, and divide them into what we call small aortic annually, which is 23 millimeter or smaller. You can, of course, say it's not adjusted for the patient size and large annually, which is more than 23 millimeter. You can see that there was patient in, in all groups with all three valves. And if you look, what was actually the hemodynamic performance of these valves? The blue one are the small annually, 23 millimeter or smaller, and the red one are the large annually, 23, larger than 23 millimeter. And maybe not surprising, you see that the two self-expanding platform, the Portico and the Evolut platform, provide less, a smaller mean gradient compared to the balloon expandable valve. But also there was no difference between the portico valve and the evolute valve. Despite one, the portico valve have intra-anal leaflet position where the other one got a supra-anal leaflet position. And going to effective orifice area, same pattern again, both self-expanding valve provide larger opening area than the balloon expandable valve. But again, no statistical significant difference between the portico valve and the evolute valve for both small and large aortic annually. And what we were discussing is patient prestige mismatch. And you can see here for patient with small annually, large, about 25% of the patient treated with the Sapien platform will have severe patient prestige mismatch compared to only 3% of the patient with the portico of the Evolut. So I think this is a little bit of an eye opener that we always said that self-expanding technology with a super and a different position is going to provide the best hemodynamic outcome, the lowest risk of patient prosthesis mismatch. But you can see it doesn't really come out in this study here. It shows it's the same degree whether you use intra or super anal position. One of the explanation can be the valve design. You see here for the portico valve, when the leaflets are opening up, they will go all the way up to 90 degrees, so no obstruction of the outflow. Whereas for the uh, Evolut valve, due to the stent frame configuration, um, there will be some restriction in the leaflet. They will be uh, hampered, hampered by the tapered stent frame configuration in opening, so they will not open fully. And also the Sapien platform, the leaflets are tapered, so they will not open up to a full uh, 90 degrees. So I think this can be one of the explanations why you get the same hemodynamic performance for portico valve self-expanding technology with internal leaflet position compared to the Evolute valve with a tapered stent frame. Nico, any comments on this uh, uh, finding here? What do you think about it? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the idea of supra-annular versus intra-annular is an interesting one and, and the way the leaflets are arranged. Um, but there may be an, an additional um, mechanism uh, that's leading to these better effective orifice areas uh, with self-expanding than balloon expandable. And it's a very simple idea. Uh, the idea is the amount of oversizing we're generating 
um, in the annulus. The balloon expandable valves, we can get anywhere between zero and 10%. That's what we're aiming for. For self-expanding, we try to aim somewhere between 15 and 25, even 27%. So it's only natural we're going to be putting larger valves with the self-expanding because if you aim for that oversizing with balloon expandable, you're going to get run the risk of annular rupture, coronary obstruction. Um, and so by virtue of their mechanism of anchoring, um, you know, I think it lends itself, uh, you know, partly a part of the explanation is just that we're implanting larger valve sizes with self-expanding because they're safer to do with greater oversizing. Hmm. So back to this specific patient we start to discuss, Francesco, your heart team, what, what would you recommend this patient with the, with the discussion we had now and you're seeing the clinical and the CT findings? So first of all, I would never discuss uh, uh, this patient without um, uh, knowing the patient itself. Uh, I think in the modern heart team discussion, we should go beyond numbers and beyond the uh, pictures. Uh, so I, it would be very difficult for me to uh, uh, suggest surgery or TAVI. Uh, I would say what is fundamental for this patient anyhow is that we uh, end up the procedure without patient prosthesis mismatch. We end the procedure without AV conductance abnormalities, without PV leak. And uh, we keep an eye for the future and we allow coronary access in the future. She is young and uh, pro it, it could uh, develop coronary disease in the future. So whatever we do, we need to uh, make sure that we, uh, we do the right thing. And uh, this can be achieved with TAVI today, uh, no problem. Uh, and the decision between the two procedures, TAVI or surgery should be shared with the patient and with the, with the caregivers and, and, the, and the referring cardiologist. But uh, in, my, in my practice, uh, usually if the anatomy is favorable, I have no problem to offer a TAVI. Obviously, we are living in a paradigm shift where uh, TAVI, in my practice at least, is first line option uh, in most patients. And, becomes, uh, uh, and surgery becomes uh, a solution for those patients who have uh, anatomical uh, uh, contraindications for, uh, for TAVI. She has a good femoral axis. Uh, the anatomy is, is favorable. There is no big risk of, uh, of uh, 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 coronary obstruction or other uh, complications. So I think uh, if the patient uh, doesn't really feel like going to surgery, if the patient looks fragile, and because of the high risk of having a patient prosthesis mismatch, I would say not in my hands. If, if I would operate, I would not, I would fight against PPM. But anyhow, for the general risk, she may be a good candidate for TAVI, specifically for the small size. All very good points, Francesco. Uh, that was a European perspective, at least from Milan. What about North, North America, uh, Nico? What, what would uh, go into your considerations? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, um, you know, I would look at to whether or not there's any concomitant procedures to be done. Um, so is there a mitral valve? Is there coronary disease? Um, if the patient is free of coronary disease, um, let's take this example, free of coronary disease, uh, patient is relatively small. Um, and if the s surgeon thinks that they're going to be putting in a relatively small valve, um, then I would go for a self-expanding valve. Um, and maybe we can talk about it after, but, you know, I think the hemodynamics and the rate of structural valve deterioration may be better uh, with self-expanding valves than surgery to some degree. Um, again, it has to be in the absence of coronary disease uh, because the risk of developing something over the course of her lifetime is going to be very small, probably in the single digits. And if we can attain commissural alignment, I think that would be okay. If the patient has coronary disease, um, and I think I had have to implant a 23 millimeter sapien, 
so just to maintain coronary access in the future because we like to implant sapiens when they have coronary disease, um, then I would probably stay away uh, because I'd be afraid of developing PPM and hopefully uh, the surgeon would be able to do a better job uh, with respect to implanting a larger valve. But I agree with Francesco, this is a very borderline patient and I think patient preference uh, comes into the picture here as well. Yeah. And that was actually also what we were discussing here in, in Copenhagen, that uh, there was two factors. The patient was pretty young and, and could go for surgery, but there was two things which was uh, make the decision for Tavi, first of all, the risk of PPM, and also the patient preference. She, she wants to have Tavi. She was not very keen to have surgery. So we can just go get the slide up again. Uh, we can just show um, what kind of valve was, was uh, chosen here. We choose the next generation portico valve, what's called now the Navitor valve. Again, it's self-expanding technology with large stem cells, so it's easier to access the coronary arteries, also because it's intra-analytical mm -hmm. position, not super-analytical position. And what's with this Navitor valve compared to the portico valve is that you have this external sealing skirt, the Navitor seal, in order to mitigate the risk of, of paravalvular leak. It currently comes in four sizes, 23, 25, 27, and 29 covering aortic annually up to 27 millimeter. But there's a fifth and larger valve, the Titan valve, under trial now, and that will close the gap up to 30 millimeter. It's delivered in this FlexNav system. It's an inline sheet, so for the two smaller valve sides, it's comparable with a 14 French sheet, and for the two larger one with a 15 French sheet. Very hydrophilic coated and very flexible system, so easy to deliver. So actually the plan for this patient was to do a transfemoral TAVI in local anesthesia, no sedation, no anesthetic team in the room, using the right femoral artery or common artery for access, insert a 14 French sheet, and when we were ready, exchange for the FlexNav system with the integrated sheet on, closure with two pro-style, using cerebral embolic protection device, doing a pre-dilatation with a 20 millimeter balloon, which match the minor axis of the aortic annulus, and then implant a Navitor 25 valve. So we can see the recorded case now. We're going to skip all the first part. So we start where we have a pigtail down in the left ventricle. So if, if you start the case now. So we can we can okay. start here looking at the hemodynamics order. Mm -hmm. So let's see, we have a couple of axes. I can come a little bit back with the pigtail. Yeah, like see, so you have more stable rhythm. Yeah, she has clear gradients. There's no doubt about that. So let's take here a uh, snapshot. So, okay, her gradients are indeed uh, uh, invasively a peak to peak of 94 yeah. millimeters mercury. So clearly, no, uh, yeah. no doubt about the, the severity of the aortic stenosis. And then we look especially to the end diastolic pressures. Yes. Yeah. So um, 24 and diastolic pressure in the aorta is 40, 64. 64. So we, yeah. we're going to recall these numbers. Yeah. All right. So we can um, come with a yeah. stiff wire. Let's also maybe get the pacing. Uh, that's maybe also uh, interesting to get in place and show. Mm. Yeah, so that's something uh, maybe you can explain what you do here. Yeah, as I think most sites have moved to, to use LV pacing instead of RV pacing, uh, having one electrode on the stiff guide wire and, and having a needle in the skin for the second one. It often causes muscular contraction. It's a little bit unpleasant for the patients. So, so what we do is we have this uh, five friends venous sheet just as a backup if the patient would have complete AV block and we, we're going to have a short guide wire introduced into that um, mm -hmm. sheet here and we're going to connect the pace electrode to that short guide wire and it's, I think it's going to give you better contact, uh, higher uh, efficiency of your pacing and also your patient doesn't have these muscle contractions during pacing. So. Yep. I think there's some advantages of using this technique instead of just a needle in the skin. So no, this is now the extra small yeah. safari guide small. wire. Yeah. All fits with the smaller anatomy yeah. in this patient. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're going to place this here. So push it a bit forward here to no. the LV and you can walk it out, Ole. No, we try to keep it just neutral there. Mm -hmm. Wire. Good. Okay. And then I think we are all set yeah. for pre-dilatation. Pre yeah, the valve is ready. It has been prepped. 
And as mentioned, uh, we're going to respect uh, the minor axis of the aortic annulus, which was 20 millimeter mercury. Yep. So, so the balloon got the same size here, 20 millimeter balloon. It's a it's a non-compliant balloon. It's the true balloon from Bart, uh, which I think is is probably the best balloon on the market. It's it's really fast to inflate and deflate, mm -hmm. and it will take you to the nominal diameter. You cannot really yeah. over inflate it. So now we're going to attach the second electrode here, crocodile mm -hmm. electrode to the guide wire. We don't scratch anything. And I don't. It's not often not needed. And we can pace here, um, Martin, if you pace uh, 180 max output. Yeah, we can start pacing. Going up with the balloon. Yeah, that's okay, good. coming down, and you can stop pacing. So, yeah, and of course, just changes. check for AV block before we, we AV remove block. everything. No, it's not. There's no AV block, so. No. Okay, now we carefully remove this balloon while keeping the stiff wire in the LV, of course. And then... Uh, so, Lars, what will be the next step then? It's... Uh, you will probably remove this into, uh, this this uh, sheet, yes? And yeah, because uh, it's a 14 French sheet and this uh, flex snap system is compared with, with a 14 French system. So, we take the 14 yeah. French sheet out here and come in with the inline sheet. Mm -hmm. So, I... So, I press a little loose, Birgit. So, if I compress here in the groin, or if you... Yep. Remove the sheet and we keep a course close take this also with me. Look at the guide wire. And yeah, we keep the guide the wire. Okay, yeah. so I'll do some compression here. Yep. I'm gonna clean the wire in the meantime. And um, and also it's a, it's a really nice uh, delivery system here. It's it's hydrophilic coated, so it's it's often very easy to introduce it and, Wait, and it's a very flexible system here. Tiny bit over sheet. Yep, that's better. Yep. Okay, so I'll just take a little bit of saline here and a wet swap here too. Yeah, it can be made very hydrophilic. hydrophilic. Yeah. So we'll go in here. And yeah, so that like goes this, smooth up. And yeah. we can reconnect here to the pressure yeah. line. Then we can give also the end of the wire here for the potential need for pacing. Just connect it here. And let's put some uh, bigger drape on this. It's okay. So I think we're ready to pass uh, the arch, Ole, yep. and uh, and you'll see it's often, as I said, extremely flexible. So it it will take very tortuous anatomy, acute angulation mm -hmm. of the arch. So yeah, that's true. It's a quite safe system to introduce. Yeah. Okay. Now so we now go. So now we at the analyst level here. So we can go to now to the. Cospo, Cospo overlap, it was not an extreme angle, it was just 5 REO, which we have now, and 28 caudal. So we're almost there, yeah, yeah, I think we're there. Let's have a look how it looks, the system, and if our the transcatter hard valve system is aligned, and actually that's the case, almost, yeah. yeah. So we're working in the right-left cusp overlap, mm -hmm. yes, so that means our right and left cusp are overlapped. Yeah. On the right-hand side of uh, your transcutter heart valve, and the non is where the pechtel is in? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So, let's, we can just do an injection here just to confirm that we got the pigtail in the right position, so we're not getting fooled. Mm -hmm. We're giving 10 cc at 20 cc per second. So, pigtail is in a... Not completely in the bottom. No, I can maybe push it just two millimeter further down. Sometimes it's, of course, bulky like cut. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we, we want to have that marker you see the yeah. radio pack marker at the endless level. So Ole is going to stabilize the handle and he will actually control the height by adjusting the guide wire tension during the deployment. So if it's diving down, Ole mm -hmm. is pushing a little bit up on the guide wire. And I think that's, um, it's also going to lock the system here on the guide wire. So you, you'll see very little movement during- I push a little on the wire now. Yeah, yep. deployment. So we see the marker point is now just at the bottom of the non coronary cusp. We at the first intersection, we can do one more t test. That's good. I think that looks fine. Yeah, so that's Going important over, to yeah. check. Yep. I can do a little bit of rotation maybe on to see if we can get... I show a tiny bit more LV. Yeah, and, and now the 
no scorn is in and now we just keep the wire back into the LV. Yeah, I think that was smooth and then let's see uh, for the rhythm what we then we can make a decision uh, Lars here on uh, on our crocodile here. Yeah. Well, it seems she has her own rhythm, so we can uh, take the pace off and yeah. uh, pull it out. Yeah, I yeah. think so. so it's now fine. it's sinus rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's the moment to recapture the nose cone. Yeah. Just tell so us what we do. William. Yeah. You see on this handle at the end of the handle there are these two blue knobs at the at the side. So that's the one to retract the nose cone. So I'm going to do that. I'm retracting slowly. I push a little bit on the uh, stiff guide wire. Retract a bit more. Push a tiny bit on the wire. Retract a bit more, and then you leave typically a small gap, yeah, yeah. like this. And okay, we have now the 14, 14 French, French sheet is ready. ready. So we're coming out. I do compression. Yeah, trick a little loose in the bucket. I compress in the grind. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So this goes out, and now just the 14 French sheets, which is comparable with the FlexNav delivery system goes in, then we have full hemostasis again. Yeah. So Very good. Fine. Then we're gonna take a pigtail again. And you can so take the dilator, dilator out and a pigtail into the LV. We do we like to do the hemodynamics in every single case. Yep. Yeah, you're in. Yep. Very good. Yep. Yep, okay. And I can have a J-wire while we do the yes. recording here. Yeah. Good idea. So what are you going to use the J-wire for now? Yeah, you so I left the um, I left the um, pigtail here in the non-coronary cusp during the final deployment mm -hmm. just to make sure we had a good understanding what happened to the valve. So it's often not a major issue. You can just go in here with mm -hmm. a standard guide wire, push a bit on the wire, and yep. then slowly come back with your with your pigtail. Yeah, I agree. It's good to have that reference point. You use it as your reference during the entire valve yeah. deployment, yeah. even with the release. I also prefer to keep it, but mm -hmm. and then indeed, as it's demonstrated here, you have to use your wire to release it. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Then we chop yeah. part yeah, like this. We'll go again. So let's try to look at the hemodynamics. We had 64 mm -hmm. before, we have 63, same. We had yeah. 24, we have 21. So, so we even have more and diastolic yeah. separation because so there was 40 millimeters mercury now 42. So that uh, certainly that, that does promising. not indicate any severe yeah. regurgitation. So bef we can do that um, to fine enter here in a cusp overlap view yeah. also to try to get rid of the descending aorta so we don't have any overlap between the LV and the Indeed, I think it's important that you stress this. I mean, in right, uh, in this right left cuspovula view, you have probably your native anatomy and your transcutaneous heart valve kind of aligned, and you have no overlap with the aorta. I think that's really mm. important when you yeah. do this assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't see any uh, PVL, and we have a very nice high position. We are about three millimeter below yeah, the aortic endless. So that's. Yeah. Excellent. That's actually where we should be. Yeah, yeah. No gradient, no PVL, yeah. and we got also uh, no need for, for pacing here. Yeah, you go in aerial projection to open up the bifurcation, yes, yeah. the femoral bifurcation, yep. Yeah. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that looks That's fine. So okay. I think um, we can conclude this case. So mm -hmm. uh, again, you saw it was a, a patient with with longer life expectancy, small aortic annulus, uh, with the risk of patient prestige mismatch, and thereby also uh, early valve failure. Mm -hmm. Navitor valve provided excellent outcome, as if I should say it. Uh, yeah. Very nice opening, no gradient, no PVL, no conduction system, no yeah. pivalve leak. So I think that's um, that's fine. Yeah, I think okay. so too. Yes, perfect case. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Nico. Any comments on uh, on the choice of valve and the procedure here? Uh, anything you would have done different uh, in a case like this in your institution? Uh, no, uh, Lars. Look up. You know, I think you selected the the right valve size. Uh, you chose a self expanding valve. Um, you know, we were also discussing before the webinar, you know, what type of effective orifice area does a 25 millimeter portico give you? 
Uh, it's approximately 1.7, uh, similar to a uh, 26 uh, Evolute. So um, look, you avoided definitely PPM. Um, you got a perfect position. You implanted a valve with uh, very large cells, and I, I saw that uh, commercial alignment was pretty good as well. Um, so um, really no comments. It was uh, just a, a very, very nice procedure. And you, Francesco, you have quite a lot of experience with the porticone avatar valve in, uh, during the years. Yeah, so Lars, it looks like we don't speak enough together uh, about our best practice, but we do exactly the same. So I, I use exactly your technique. I think uh, what is important for the audience, uh, uh, you did a good predilection with a proper uh, balloon, which is uh, uh, performing pretty well. And I think it's, in, it's fundamental for this device to have a prepared uh, anatomy. Uh, you use the cusp overlap approach, which I think today should become a standard, uh, f at least for uh, Evolutes and, and for, uh, uh, and for uh, the Portico family overall. Um, you may discuss whether you use it also for the Bosso Scientific Platform. I use it also for that one, at least for the first initial uh, uh, decision making. Uh, I've seen that you leave the pigtail until the very end, which is also what I try to tell everybody because in a self-expanding profile, you need to get control until the very end of the height of implantation. You've been very careful in, in uh, uh, managing the AV node uh, structures by uh, even keeping the, the wire idle at the very beginning of the procedure. These are details that are very important to, to be uh, uh, to be said, to be underlined in, uh, in this webinar, because again, we're talking about best practice, but also we're talking about avoiding uh, all the post potential complications of TAVI in a patient who is otherwise operable. So I think it's very important to, to go for the best, uh, to reduce the risk of, uh, uh, so there is no PV leak. So I told you, we need four points. Uh, no patient prosthesis mismatch, which I think you achieved with the large valve, uh, uh, as we have seen in, the, in your data. There is no PV leak. There is no AV conductance abnormality, and you were able to align to the commissures with a device which is uh, intraannular, large cells design, and therefore, eventually, if the patient will need the coronary axis in the future, uh, you have done the best you can. So I think uh, congratulations and excellent result. So we got a few questions here from uh, from the chat. Um, maybe I can address the first one to you, Francesco. It's about what about three D printed heart valves? Is there any wishes around the corner? Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat what three D printed heart valves? Uh, I guess that's going to be maybe a model to look at at the valve before you do your valve implantation. Uh, are you talking about? Scan. No, I don't understand. Again. Sorry, I, I I didn't hear well. So treating the valve before implantation. No, I mean this is a question about using three D printing from the CT scan ah, to, okay. to look sorry, at the sorry. Uh, okay. annual procedures. Okay, three D printing. Uh, for those who know us, uh, we have been discussing a lot of times, me and Nico, about three D printing, uh, because I was not such a great believer. I think overall 3D printing can be useful, but to be honest with the uh, recent advances in, uh, in, in, uh, in 3D modeling, uh, 3D printing may become less uh, of a tool to be used, at least for uh, uh, aortic. Uh, mitral tricuspid can be different, and 3D printing may become a very important uh, tool for uh, uh, pre-procedural training in complex procedures where you want to have a patient-specific simulator. So, but in, in my practice, I, I, I don't think that 3D printing should become a standard uh, uh, tool for uh, patient selection and, and procedural planning for TAVI specifically. I don't know what, uh, what is the opinion of uh, Nico, maybe as much more experienced than me. Yeah, and maybe also, Nico, maybe you can address if, if, it's, if it's a site which is going to start a TAVI program, will there be a role for this to have a better understanding what you're going to do? 
Uh, I'm on the same lines as Francesco. I don't think uh, 3D printed models have uh, much of a role to play with uh, Tavi. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think the uh, computer modeling, uh, such as with uh, FIOPS, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, you can incorporate, um, you know, some finite element analysis, some uh, computer modeling with respect to different heights and valve sizes and see if you're going to get conduction abnormalities or paravibular leaks. Um, I do think that's probably the future. I think as we accumulate data, we will be able to model uh, using computer softwares uh, exactly which valve um, would give us the best results. Um, I think we're several years away from that, but uh, you know, artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, is of course here today. And I think if we apply it properly, um, I think computers will be telling us, uh, choose valve X at this depth and do it this way in order to get the best possible results. So, Francesco, if you talk about lifetime management of these patients with longer life expectancy, all biprosthetic valve is eventually going to fail if the patient lives long enough. So let's say that we start out with a transcatheter heart valve and uh, that's going to fail down the line. What is the experience for, for surgical expansion of these valves? Is this something which is uh, straightforward? Or so uh, I had a discussion uh, with my colleagues here a few weeks ago after, you know, there has been a publication showing that uh, surgery following a transcated heart valve implantation uh, ends up in a very high risk uh, procedure with high mortality, high chance of having complications. And I, don't, I would not uh, uh, downgrade the complexity of treating these patients if, uh, you know, if they need to be operated. Overall, specifically, when we operate today, those patients coming for surgery usually either have endocarditis or other problems because in the past we have been only operating elderly patients with comorbidities. So obviously, if these patients come back to us today, these are challenging patients overall. But from a technical standpoint, uh, excluding the issue of endocarditis, from a technical standpoint, and happened to me a few times to, uh, to remove an implanted uh, uh, transcatheter valve, it is not that a, a, a disaster. I mean, I, you know, I thought it was much more difficult. Obviously, if you have a self-expanding device, which is... Uh, uh, long and, and, and in contact with the ascending aorta, you have the first uh, challenge to, uh, to remove this valve by initially removing the endothelialization, which is usually never so aggressive. And uh, it, we should uh, start doing some surgical training sessions to just to teach that they should use ice uh, to make the device softer and make it easier to remove it. There is obviously some eating tissue that you need to cope with, and at the end, you need to take care of the annulus, uh, of the native annulus. And I will take, tell you about that later. Uh, while if you have a balloon expandable uh, device, you just have to uh, uh, crimp it with, uh, with some uh, surgical tools, and, and usually it's, they are very easy to be removed. The only challenge, or, or let's say the main challenge remains uh, what you do afterwards. And uh, uh, what, what you have in a patients who have been treated with TAVI, uh, the native calcium has been incorporated into the annulus. So the, the neo-annulus, let's say the annulus that remains after the TAVI, is an annulus which is very different from the annular tissue that you have in a, a de novo procedure. Usually in a patient who has never been treated before, you find a cleavage, you find a plane where you can really extract the calcium easily and you can find also the annular, the annular uh, uh, structures very, very easily. Uh, after TAVI, this is not the case. Uh, you need to be, I mean, I don't even tell you uh, the rules because I didn't have to do hundreds, but I found uh, the anatomy to be a little bit funny that doesn't mean that it's, it's uh, an impossible procedure. Uh, so I would not overemphasize the, the high risk of uh, removing a THV, uh, but for sure I would not say it is a super easy. It's a 
it's obviously more difficult than a, a procedure in a patient that was been never touched before. Hmm. So, so Nico, I, I, we will have to foresee that this patient coming back 10, 15 years after Tavi is not keen to sign up for, for surgical expansion. So it's probably going to be a Tavi in Tavi. So, so what is the, the chancing in, in these cases uh, for Tavi in Tavi? What, what should we consider here in lifetime management? Yeah, so, you know, of course, um, it's going to be uh, the risk of uh, coronary access. Um, you know, if you do have, uh, for instance, an evolute valve that fails, uh, the idea of putting a second evolute, um, you know, runs the risk of not only pushing up the initial prosthetic valve leaflets uh, against the frame, but now you got yourself caged uh, with with two frames. So it, it's sort of like a double whammy. Um, and that's not good for coronary access. So, you know, although we used to do that in the past, uh, that is not common practice anymore, and it should be highly discouraged. Um, so, um, you know, there are now novel techniques and novel tools uh, to perform basilica, for instance, a type of basilica procedure where, um, you know, we're probably going to be excising or cutting these leaflets Uh, in order to optimize the placement of a second valve. Uh, but all of this is still an evolution, uh, but definitely uh, will become common practice in the future. Yeah. So, and also if you want to do leaflet modifications such as the Basilica, you also have to think on that already from the first valve implantation because you need to have commercial alignment, otherwise it's it's not going to be very effective. Uh, effective. But again, it's just, it's just again underlying. If you're going to treat this patient, we also need to we need to think far ahead. It's not only about how to execute a safe procedure today, but also what's coming next when the patient is coming back with coronary artery disease, or we need a second valve later on. So it it's going to be a much more complex decision uh, in t treating these patients. Yeah, I cannot agree more. I mean, we uh, we we are not anymore in the pioneering phase of uh, of uh, procedures which are offered to patients without alternatives. Uh, again, I want to uh, emphasize my maybe you make it for granted, but a surgeon that that tells that uh, first line option is Tavi in most patients is already an achievement. Uh, and I think it is the case. Today, there is a paradigm shift. Uh, we, we have to realize, on the other hand, that that comes with a consequence that every operator should understand that TAVI is not anymore something you can do superficially. You need to know the deep, uh, deep understanding of what you do, uh, obtain good results in all patients, and uh, have a lifetime management approach. Mm -hmm. So I think we getting to the end of this session. I think it was a very, very good discussion. Thank you, Francesco and uh, Nico. So you can see here, if as time is moving to patients with a longer life expectancy, there will be issues which we did not consider in the past, where we only treating, like we were treating patients with a few years of life expectancy, and it was all about improving symptoms and quality of life. But now it's going to, as I said before, a much more complex uh, decision. Durability is certainly one thing to take into account access to the coronary arteries, conduction abnormality, a need for a permanent pacemaker, and what about parallel valve leak? And I also think that we cannot make one decision for all patients. We have to look at each individual patient and see what is particularly the issue for this patient. And, and again, if you have patients with small aortic anomaly and where you can foresee there's a risk of patient prestige mismatch, which will impact both the durability of the valve, but also The, the risk of mortality for this patient, you need to, to choose a platform which provide both a good hemodynamic performance and a low risk of, of patient prestige mismatch, but also keep in mind what is going to be done the day the valve is going to fail. How can you actually re-intervene with this patient? And as Francesco was saying, it's unlikely that this patient with a structural valve deterioration is going for surgical explantation, they will probably come back for a TAVI and TAVI procedure. And as Nego was just highlighting here, it's, it's really important from the beginning to, to think that into your decision making, make sure you have, you choose a valve platform, which of course is going to give you good hemodynamic performance, 
but also will you allow you to do a valve and valve procedure later on and still be able to access the coronary arteries. So, Francesco, Nico, thanks a lot for, for an excellent discussion on this. And for you who attended this uh, session here, I hope it was very useful for you. Uh, have a nice evening and hope to see you all soon in person, uh, maybe at your PCR. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lars. Bye-bye. Yeah, Thank you. Good job.